Hello, this is Lowell Thompson with Learning with Lowell, a podcast that covers healthcare, biotech, anything science related really, or anything that really fascinates me. I'm open to input on that. Any suggestions, advice, send them my way. Go to learningwithlowell.com and subscribe today. I have Today we are joined by Matt, the editor of Trends in Bio- Biotechnology, Cell Press. We will be looking at the things he's working on, the things he's fascinated about, recent things going on in biotechnology, and more. His background, how we got here, it all. It's all going to be covered. So let's jump in and start asking questions. So if we could just get like a brief, a little snippet about you, like what are some of the fascinating things that you're working on and uh, working with, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, so I am the editor of the journal Trends in Biotechnology. This is a reviews journal that Cell Press publishes. Um, you know, if you're in the biomedical research space, you might know us for Cell or Neuron or Structure or any of those journals. Um, and the journal that I edit is Cell Press's home for applied biology. And we do everything from biofuels, bioenergy, to genomics and CRISPR and synthetic biology, to stem cells and tissue engineering. So it's, uh, it's very broad. I never get bored. Um, there's always something new to work on, which is really nice. How did you get into it? Like, what were like what was the driving forces that got you into being the editor? Yeah, I think I have a pretty common editor's story, which is, you know, I went to grad school, um, and then toward the end of grad school, and then I did a postdoc briefly, especially throughout the postdoc, you know, I started to realize that the parts of science and research I liked were more of the presentation, the scientific communication, um, the putting things together and and really telling people what it really means. So I love those days where I could just like go to a coffee shop and write a paper. And, um, you know, some of my, my classmates thought I was crazy for saying that. But then I get here, I think that's actually a pretty common editor experience. Um, I didn't know that you could be a scientific editor as a job until uh, probably about eight months before I started here at Cell Press. And then I realized, oh, yeah, not only is this a thing you can do, but um, the Boston area is one place where it's actually possible to do it. And so I think I kind of got lucky in that respect. Um, but yeah, then I applied for the job and it turns out that I really like it. I think this is a really nice way to strike a balance between being involved in science and, and understanding the cool things that are going on and meeting interesting people, but then not having to worry about doing the experiments or having them fail or anything like that. That's a, it's a, it's a good thing to be doing because you need people to kind of like synthesize it. Cause there's just like so much coming out Oh, yeah. To have someone be like, okay, I understand this and kind of like break it down. Like, here are some of like the trends. And it kind of like acts as a primer so that even more people can get involved. And uh, yeah, which I think is just fantastic. Yeah, I think that's a really great thing about reviews, um, review articles, reviews journals. And we really emphasize accessibility to non experts. So, like, you don't have to be an expert in metabolic engineering or whatever to read our articles. And you are, you guys have a Twitter. You have the, the, all these will be in the link show notes so everyone can click and kind of like check everything out that we're going to be talking about but they have a twitter that i that i know of and you have at least two websites is there any other way to be like current other than getting the journals specifically themselves is there any other way to be like up in what you guys do yeah i think um following at trends in biotech is probably the best way um you know subscribe to our rss feed which is on the journal homepage. all right great and those will be in the show notes for everyone listening all right so jumping over so a personal question, uh, when you're on the Cell Press website, it, in the description, it talks about how you craft and make beverages. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I actually went to grad school in the um, San Francisco area, and so that's really close to wine country. Um, some friends of mine and I decided it would be fun to start making wine. So one day we you know, placed an order of grapes with this, this local company that goes and buys up surplus grapes from the, from the wineries. And um, it turns out that we didn't quite know how much 100 pounds of grapes was, but it's a lot. And so we spent probably five or six hours one evening smashing grapes and collecting the juice and um, running back to the store and buying more equipment and more fermenters and everything else. Um, I should mention that I'm a chemical engineer by background. And so this is really a lot of fun to like put the, you know, applied enzymology into practice and like make your own fermenter and your own reactors and stuff. And so we got, we got a big kick out of that. Um, we made probably 
probably four or five batches of wine. And um, we, you know, we calculated that as long as the stuff we were making was better than three buck chuck, then we were coming out ahead. And I think it was. Um, unfortunately, now living in the Boston area, it's a lot harder to get the grapes. Um, so I've started to do a little bit of beer. I'm planning to do a little cider next fall. But um, yeah, the wine was what really got me into it. How, how much, like, actually, like, if you can convert it to gallons, how much does a hundred pounds, uh, how much does a hundred pounds convert over to, you said batches, like, how much is, like, a gallon, how many gallons would that convert to? Yeah, so that's about, um, I think we had probably a six-gallon glass carboy, and so that's about six gallons worth of wine, which is, um, you know, I, don't, I can't do the conversion from gallons of milliliters off the top of my head, but it's a couple of cases, it's still a lot. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. You'd have to really work to drink six, uh, six gallons of wine. You know, I think if you go to my friend's basement in Berkeley, California, there's probably still a rack full of the stuff to be made down there. Because yeah, it takes a long time to get through. What are, when it comes to like equipment, like let's say someone else wanted to get into that, what are what are like the things to that you would need to get to kind of like start out just to see if you you are interested in it? like what are like the what's the minimum valuable product that you need to get to like make right. something in your basement? Right. Um, so you'll need for making wine or let, let's say that you already have a fermentable liquid. So you're not worrying about uh, I don't know, extracting sugars or whatever. And you can buy these. You can buy like a kit of grape juice concentrate or something. Um, you'll need something to ferment it in. So like a plastic bucket works fine. Uh, and then you'll, you'll pitch yeast into there and wait a few weeks. And the, you know, the yeast eat up all the sugar and make alcohol. Uh, and then you need something to age it in. Um, this also helps to clarify. You'll see junk settle to the bottom. So like a glass jug is good for that. Um, if you wanted to work on a really small scale, like a like a 1.5 gallon plastic bucket and a one gallon, like a glass old school milk jug would probably do the trick. Is there any potential for it to explode? Like if you were in like a glass jar, does that, the pressures ever get in, substantive enough where like the glass would like explode? Yeah, if you're doing beer or something else with carbonation in it, sure. Um, with wine, that doesn't happen because you don't have any bottle fermentation going on. So you're not getting a lot of CO2 go up inside the wine bottle, and you shouldn't get any pressurization. I've always kind of wanted to make wine in my free time. But then, like, that's like the one thing. I haven't spent the research to, to figure out if I can do it um, legally where I'm at, which I, I doubt there'd be a problem. But, like, I, I've always thought, like, that, I feel like there's so much pressure there that it should like crack or something. So that's good to know. Yeah, I think you, I think you see that with amateur beer makers a lot more. They fail to account for um, the the extra CO2 buildup in their bottled product, and then you know a week later they look in their basement and it's just shattered. Well, no one gets hurt. They just have to clean it up. So that's, right. That's, if, of, of all the lessons to have, that's a nice one. Right. Over bodily harm. Um, kind of segueing over to bioenergy, which is mm -hmm. like going green literally. Uh, with that kind of knowledge of fermentation and like working on that, does it give you an interesting perspective on that, that, that field of uh, biotechnology? Yeah, actually I think it does. Um, it's funny, you know, when you hear fermentation in popular culture, you hear, you think of exactly this, like, like alcohol, and, you know, wine and beer. Um, fermentation in industry is really any process where you're using microbes to convert one chemical to another one. Um, and so if you've got the idea of um, like making biofuels or something from corn, like that's a fermentation, even though it doesn't necessarily make ethanol. Some of them do. Um, and so I think, I think that does give me an interesting perspective in terms of understanding better, you know, how, how you're going to have to grow microbes and, and what sort of cultures are necessary and what sort of equipment is necessary. Um, obviously, what we were doing is on a much, much smaller scale, but you know, the process remains the same. Do you think we'll ever be to the point where, like, it'll be a significant portion of our, like, energy pie circle? Like, right now? Yeah, it depends on what you mean by significant. Um, it's never going to be to the point of accounting for all of our fuels as much as some optimists think it is. You know, I think it'll continue to grow. And if you look at those charts of where we get our energy from, you know, biomass is grown from really negligible 20 years ago to sort of negligible now. Um, something that we have to think a lot more about is what we're going to make it out of. 
So I think really the first generation of this sort of thing was, okay, we're going to grow a bunch of corn, which has a lot of sugar in it, and we're going to ferment it into alcohol, and we're going to drop it in the gas tanks. And that works okay. Um, corn ethanol by itself is not a great fuel because you can't just drop it into a gas tank and make it work. And also you need just enormous areas of corn fields to even come close to what we need for the United States transportation. Like it's many states worth of area. So it just doesn't really, it's not really feasible, I don't think. Um, you know, the other approaches are looking at what's called lignocellulose. So this is taking uh, like the, the woody byproducts of crops or trees or grasses and then chewing them up with bacteria or fungi uh, to make fuels out of that. Uh, where I think really the enthusiasm is now is in algae. So if you grow algae um, from a variety of substrates, you can process them in various ways to make different kinds of fuels. So you can make uh, diesel fuel or you can make jet fuel or whatever. Um, I think really probably the most enthusiasm right now is in studying algae. Would you need, is the, is the throughput still like state's amount or would it, like how much would you need to have like a significant, let's say like 10% of our pie chart is for biofuels. How much? Um, not, not an entire Iowa worth, which is the nice part about it. Yeah. You can, you can make different kinds of reactor configurations to grow up algae in high densities. And that's, um, you know, there's a lot of engineering that needs to be done with that still. So I don't think I can give you a good number for that yet, but it's certainly orders of magnitude smaller. Well, that's interesting. And it kind of helps out with, uh, putting some O2 out there, especially with all the de deforestation we've been going through. Sure, yeah. You know, you hear this term, the uh, the food versus fuel debate, and I think uh, I think food's won that pretty handily. So, we, you know, we can't compete with, are we going to be able to feed our people with, are we going to be able to fuel our cars? And so, yeah, I think having a smaller footprint is useful there. I was trying to find, like, a fancy way to say it so I wouldn't sound stupid, but I'm going to go with a stupid question. There was, There's a game called uh, Subnautica where they have bioreactors, and it kind of looks neat. Does it look... Like what is what does a bioreactor look like? Like, cause I'll put uh, I'll put them in show notes, but like I, I, for some reason, I did not look one up. Sure, I think it means different things to different people. Um, to some people, it's like what you would grow a bunch of algae in, and that just looks like tubes with green liquid in there. Um, basically, at industrial scale, a bioreactor is like any other. Like, if you go to a refinery, it's like any other giant piece of metal. Um, you know, you're not designed to be able to look inside it and see interesting things. Uh, but, you know, you'll have this uh, gallons to thousands of gallons of broth where bacteria are growing and dividing and then uh, processing your substrate. So, yeah, it's going to be like a big metal like cylinder with other metal tubes coming out of it, just like any other chemical plant. Kind of like a, another analogy, kind of like a brewery, because I went, I went on a brewery tour and there were just like these giant metal tanks. So just kind of like stacks of those yeah exactly and like the the fermenters that you see at the brewery are bioreactors that's neat i never i didn't consider that i'm i'm making a note of that <laughs> that's really neat. Right. i never i didn't i didn't think of that yeah because i mean it, it's um baker's yeast that's breaking down the sugars in your your malt or whatever converting them into alcohol that's a reaction no that's just fact. it's like one of those things that that i have never thought about like when it's pointed out it's like how did i not think of that right right we, you made a, a top five trends for 2018 post, and I was wondering what, okay, first of all, what is like one thing in the top five that you thought was really interesting that you love to highlight? Really something that's interesting to me is, um, so I put this on there, is natural products and plant synthetic biology. Um, so, you know, back to the idea of, of biofuels or microbial processes, you know, we can do genomic manipulation in microbes and it's pretty easy to do it in bacteria and a little harder in yeast but not that bad and we can make them make the kinds of chemicals we want um a next step that i think people are getting really interested in lately is doing the same thing on plants so how can we manipulate plant genomes to make interesting bioactive compounds and one of the impetuses for this is looking at chinese traditional medicine and other related fields there's been a ton of interest lately in what's called natural products. And this is anything that you could go into nature and find and say, oh, this has an interesting biological effect. Um, maybe the prototypical example would be aspirin. So, you know, we've known for 100 years that there's this one tree and it's got this bark and then the bark of the tree has a, a pain relieving compound. 
And um, this exists in, in all over the place in nature. Um, the problem is yields are bad, and these things might only grow in certain areas of the world, and there might be political fraught of, of how we're going to get them. Um, and so if we could genetically engineer other plants that grow faster to make interesting bioactive compounds, then we would have a, an easier access to those things than trying to do it chemically or, or whatever else. Um, so I think the idea of designer plants, you know, a plant that whose genome you design to make a specific kind of chemical compound, we're not there yet, um, but maybe 10 years from now we can do that. That sounds fascinating. I, I, when I was reading through everything, that's one that I didn't, was not on my radar whatsoever. So that, like, that's, that's on my to-do list to read more of. If, if someone wanted to learn more about that specific, or any on the top five, they wanted to learn more, are there specific issues uh, that you guys have put out? where they could pick up those specifically or it, or are they to like coming soon about? Yeah, that's actually a pretty great plug. Um, I don't have a special issue or anything on the, the plant idea yet. I think, again, it's a little too far away for us to have done enough lab research for it. Um, but if you look at the, the third point in there, which is biofabrication, um, I actually do have a special issue coming out in April on tissue engineering of which biofabrication is a, a pretty popular technique these days. So I think if you look in the April 2018 issue of Trends in Biotechnology, you can read more about that. Jumping to biofabrication, that's one of the areas that I have been researching a little bit about. I, maybe like a teaser for the, the, the issue, is there any discussion on making them in space and whether or not like that has any effect on like the construction of biomaterials? Yeah, that's actually really interesting. We do have a short article in the issue about growing tissues in space, um, particularly the idea of micro and hypergravity. Um, something that's really important for developing tissues is what kinds of forces they're exposed to. Um, different mechanical cues we know drives the differentiation of tissues. And so if you change those mechanical cues by putting it into space or you can change them to the gravitational environment, you get different things that happen. Um, this is obviously relevant. You know, we saw the SpaceX launch um, for if we're going to put humans in a rocket and send them to Mars, you know, if you want to create therapeutic solutions for that sort of thing. You need to know how, how tissues react to different gravitational environments. Well, I, would, I always thought that, I, I don't know how good of a, uh, an idea this is, but you know those little TARDISes, those little like teddy bear guys? The tardigrades, yeah. Yeah, tardigrades. Um, they, they're able to live in space. They don't really have anything mess them up. What if it was, you can, you can make like a shield of them, like or whatever the, that, that quality that makes not uh, genetically degrade or whatever the, the correct term is, and like put it on the outside of a ship. I wonder if yeah, I think one of the one of the fascinating things about them is how radiation resistant they are, which definitely is an important factor. Uh, I yeah, you know, I'm not an expert in tardigrade biology, so I don't really know what the um, what the mechanism behind that is. Uh, but yeah, if we could figure out what makes them so so good at what they do, we could probably incorporate that into engineered tissues too. I was just uh, it got me thinking too, and maybe we, maybe we can talk about this as if this is something that interests you. The the idea that what other life exists in our solar system, like in Titan, which kind of looks like a primordial Earth, or uh, I think Europa, which has like a lot of water underneath. I always wonder, like, wonder what type of creatures we're going to find there, especially the Europa one, because they have uh, thermal vents, which is a lot like, you know, what we have on Earth, where there's like weird little creatures living on them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the idea of prebiotic chemistry and sort of the transition between alive and not alive is really interesting. Um, you know, personally, I would be very surprised if there wasn't at least some sort of bacteria elsewhere in the universe. And this has been a, this has been a while since I read read about this, so I, I probably have the details slightly off. But the whales, like the, the the big whales, I think the blue whales, when they would die, they go to the bottom of the, the the ocean, and because their their bones are so thick, like this is the only like density of calcium necessary for these bacteria to like leach into it and create this type of like heat fusion-y stuff going on. It's, uh, like I said, it's, it's not the right terms for these things, but this made me think of it. Like they create basically little thermal vents by like activating the heat process through these uh, through the calcium and then other organisms like attach onto it. And then there's like this little tiny like reef or like little tiny thermal vent or like this built off of a, a whale carcass, which is really interesting just to think. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. You know, one thing that's continually surprises me about about microbes is their ability to consume and metabolize and live off of anything. Uh, we published an article a few months ago 
where you could use bacteria to remediate oil spills because they eat oil. There, there are bacteria that have evolved to eat plastics as well. So that's like a, like a new thing, like stepped up to like start eating all the plastics that's in the ocean. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are also bacteria that do eat polymer plastics, and that could be an, I guess that could be an approach to consuming the large plastic patches. You have to grow a lot of bacteria for that. I'm not sure what the throughput is. Yeah, it probably spread a lot. It starts eating <laughs> away at you know ships. Right. <laughs> probably would not be good. Um, right. We're going back to the bacteria that eat oil. If you were to have like the, like the type of BP oil spill, like how, mm -hmm. how many? I we probably can't get specific on this, but like, is it possible to produce enough to make a meaningful impact at this stage, or are we a couple of years off from that? Enough bacteria, you mean? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's never hard to grow enough bacteria. Um, they, I mean, they multiply very quickly. I think the bigger challenge there is in terms of targeting, in terms of uh, transport, you know, getting these things to the right place and confining them, like you said, uh, so that they're in the area of the oil spill and, and just doing everything, all these processes at scale. I don't think the number of microorganisms is limiting. It sure is since they, they breed like crazy. Don't they, don't they, uh, most microorganisms, like, a, like for us, our, our generations are about every 20 years, but for microorganisms, it's like, like every couple of seconds or something, like every 20 seconds, or was it, or is it faster or slower than that? It's, it's a little bit slower than that. So for, um, you know, for non-pathogenic E. coli, which is a very common laboratory strain for producing chemicals, um, I think the, their lifespan or their, their doubling time is about 20 minutes at body temperature and about three hours at room temperature. That's still, that's still like what, like a 10,000 X better than what we do? Something like that, yeah. So I mean, you can, you can just leave these things out in a tray for a few weeks and have, I don't even know how many zeros worth of bacteria that would make. There was, a, there was an article I read a while ago, uh, like comparing the human, our, our population as uh, like for like the, for like for a very, very, very long time, there was like no one on the planet that was human. There's only like a couple million of us. The last couple, last two centuries, really, we went from a couple million, like a hundred million or something like that to eight billion, which is like this ex exponential like hockey stick. Right. Uh, a person compared that to yeast in a Petri dish that they added sugar to it. Like they spike up, then it like crashes back down until the, the scientist was, uh, well, the person who wrote their article, article was implying that what if this happens to us? Like we're like in a petri dish running out of resources but that's kind of the fun thing that we don't have like a cap on us especially with what spacex and and uh blue origin and all these other people are doing to like push us out so yeah absolutely i think the idea of the um the planet's carrying capacity for humans has been debated for centuries now we haven't hit it yet you know, i think there was a like someone did the math and if you put every human and I, I would never want to do this but if you put every human shoulder to shoulder they would fit in texas which is kind of misleading because Texas is huge, but like that's not too bad. Yeah, that, that gives an interesting perspective on just how much of the planet is not habited by humans, at least. And another thing that I think that most people don't are not cognizant of is that the ma the majority of the planet that the majority of the planet does not support life. And like the green, like 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 um, for food, like only a small percentage of the Earth is even capable of growing stuff, like in, in a green sense. I'll push back on that. I think a lot more of it than we think is capable of producing life, but it's mostly microbial. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't mean um, life in that sense. I was thinking life in the sense of trees. Oh, in terms of, of, of yeah, land, plants, animals, certainly. Yeah, something that would support us. I was thinking yeah. kind of selfishly. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was forgetting the microbes. You got those like, extremophiles. They, uh, there, aren't there some microbes that can live in, was it, ammonia or bleach or something? Like there's like some that live... They're, they're called extremophiles, like live in like these ridiculous environments. That's that's exactly right. I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't heard of any that live in bleach, but certainly ammonia or high salt concentrations, almost boiling water, sulfur springs. Yeah, it's crazy. We'll have to work on the bleach one. We'll Janet engineer that just because we gotta we gotta like check that box off. We don't. Oh, uh, cow guts is a good one. What? Which one? Cow guts. For what can live in there, or actually bacteria can live in there. Sure, in like the the stomachs of ruminants. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. They have like four chambers in there. Right. That's probably why they're so gassy. The suck on extremophiles and like there's like this, uh, there's a, an article I was trying to remember, but I'll, I'll try and transition over to something else because it's, it's, it's eluding me. What would what, go back to something a little bit more, a little less, but a fascinating different way. What does like a typical week look like for you? Like what 
are, is it like regimented or is there a lot of variability? You know, it's, it's highly variable, I think. Um, so I deal with everything in the journal from commissioning. So this is inviting people to write articles for me, um, to evaluating proposals. If somebody wants to write something, they can send it to me and I see if that's a good fit for the, for the audience. Um, I spend a lot of time actually processing manuscripts. So I run the peer review process. Um, I will also leave independent editorial comments on all the, all the articles I get. Um, I manage revisions. I schedule what goes into what issue of the journal. Um, so there's a lot of different tasks. It never gets boring, which is really nice. Uh, and then also a big part of my job is just figuring out what is interesting to the people in the communities that my journal serves. Um, so I do a lot of research. I do a lot of reading papers. Um, I go to conferences fairly often just in an effort to understand what's interesting, um, what's trendy, for lack of a better word, and try to cover that topically. Uh, working backward, and, and I, I wrote down a, a sequence of questions based on <laughs> that one sentence, weirdly enough. Uh, what are some interesting conferences that you found that you think other people might enjoy going to? Well, most of the ones that I go to are fairly heavily scientific. So it's the kind of thing that unless you have a strong scientific background in the topic, uh, it might be a little bit impenetrable for the general public. Um, but some, some useful ones that I've been to recently, I went to a big um, European bioengineering conference a few years ago. Um, I've gone to meetings about genome engineering, um, biomedical engineering, uh, material science. So it's really, it's a very broad scope. Um, in terms of general public, it's really hard to recommend something. And I think it is mostly like graduate students presenting about their research and, and going and talk to posters and things like that. Challenge for the graduate students to explain it to laymen though, in the sense that if you can, exp if you, if you can explain it simply, then you understand it very well. So like a random person coming in and asking questions might, might be helpful as a, as a fringe benefit. Of <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I I, I got the piece of advice in grad school, like find an uncle or something who is not a scientist and try to explain it to him. And then if, if he understands it, then you've done a pretty good job. Which is which is pretty solid. I, I try that with any of the complicated stuff that I'm working on, but I, I pick my mom. Not that, she's she's like a, a farmer, so like not heavy into the sciences. Right. When when it comes to gauging interest of your audience, do you have any specific ways that you go about uh, doing that, for lack of a better word? Yeah, sure. Um most of what we do is looking at what else has been published in the field. Um, like I mentioned, my journal publishes review articles, so we don't do any research articles, but we will see what topics people are publishing research articles on, and if there's sort of an uptick in interest on a particular topic within the last maybe two, three, four years, then we know it's a good idea to find, a, find someone to write a review about that. Um, we also look at sort of less traditional things. Um, believe it or not, social media is actually pretty applicable for that. So if we see a paper that gets a lot of tweets about it, for instance, then, you know, it's not necessarily a topic we want to review right now, but it's something to pay attention to. Um, also, you know, at those conferences I mentioned, if somebody has a long line to talk to them after their talk, you know, that might be an interesting person to talk to also. When there's so many people talking to one person, do you find it hard to kind of like breach in to the <laughs> breach in, uh, probably not the right word, but like to get through to have that conversation or do you just kind of like walk up and, and just start talking and it works out? Um, it's a little of both. So, you know, if it's a very well-known person, it can be a little bit intimidating, but then again, it's a lot easier to just approach someone and say, Hey, you know, I'm the editor of this journal. Um, I really like what you, what you talked about. And would you be interested in writing a review for us? Like, at least you have some sort of basis for that conversation. So that's nice. Uh, speaking of intimidating people, is there anyone that, is there anyone that, I don't know if intimidating probably was the wrong precursor for the statement, but is there anyone that you admire or that inspires you in the biotech field or in general? Oh boy. Um, I think the, maybe the easiest answer for that is Bob Langer at MIT. Oh, the, the biotech, like the, the guy who like makes companies every six months or something like that? that that's him. Yeah. He's, um, he's actually also on my journal's editorial board. So this is a group of people that I can talk to and ask their advice about the direction of the journal and what kind of topics they want to see us publish about. Um, you know, I actually, I did have the chance to meet him exactly one time, um, probably about three minutes, extremely pleasant, but actually knew who I was because I'm like, oh yeah, I'm the editor of this journal. And he's like, right, yes, I'm on the editorial board for that. 
So uh, it, was, it was good interaction. Um, but, you know, it's hard to look at the number of patents and, uh, and spinoffs and startups and everything else that he's been a part of and, and not just be incredibly impressed. I think there was a news story put out a couple of years ago that said that because of his existence, like 300 or 350 million people are now alive because of him or something like that. I, I, might, I might be misquoting it, but it was really interesting. Yeah, that's it's really impressive. <laughs> I'm not sure how you would go about quantifying that, but I believe it. Yeah, I was like, I I want to see your data. <laughs> let me let me see your data. But that's like that's gotta be like a really satisfying thing. Like go to like if anyone ever is like you suck. Like someone cuts you off is like you're a bad person. You're like 250 million people exist because of me. What what do you do, angry driver? Hard to argue with. Yeah, when it, when you talk to people like uh, Bob or anyone else in the community that's kind of like that, are they? Oh, are, they, are they different, or are they just like us? And I say us in a blanket way. Like, are they, does that level of creativity and innovation, I guess I'm not asking the question right, but it's like, are they, are they distinct? You know what I mean? Like, are, like, if you were like, if you did not know who that guy was, and you walked up to him randomly on the street and had a five-minute conversation, and he didn't tell you his pedigree, would he still be that intense? Or does that intensity kind of like, as a factor of why he's successful, because it went into, like, the drive for him, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think just I think just like anybody else, there's a huge range of personalities. Um, I think what you'll find is as people get more and more successful, sometimes it means they get less and less accessible, which is really unfortunate. Um, it's you know, with some of these people that have done just so many great things over so many decades, it can be really hard to even get five minutes of their time. And so I think the thing that really impresses me is people who are very famous and well-known, but also take the time to respond to your emails and to say hello to you. Um, and like I said, there's a range. I think there was a, another thing that I was reading that they said that the most, mo like most of the like high achieving or successful people, they're like, they tend to be the loneliest. So it's lonely at the top? Yeah, that, that's the that's the, a much better way to state it <laughs> than my troubled way. Well, we're, regarding back to, to interest, uh, kind of like circling around, do you ever get feedback or try to cultivate feedback from people who read your journal to kind of influence the next article or just to like have feedback in general? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. So what we'll do, um, I don't know if I've done a formal reader survey, but you know, for the, for the peer reviewers who review the articles and help to improve them, um, I've done a lot of outreach to reviewers recently to um, better understand what they're looking for and, and better, guide the comments that they give to further improve um, our reviews. Um, that's one thing I always try to do a lot at conferences also, is find people who are familiar with the journal and talk to them and ask them, you know, what do you want to see in a biotechnology reviews journal? What does biotechnology even mean to you? And the answer is not consistent. Um, but the idea is that talking to a lot of different communities, different kinds of people over a long time, then you'll get some patterns that emerge. Thinking about what biotechnology means to people, it, an interesting factoid is that biotechnology, as it's conceived like today, is only like 40 years old. It started with uh, like a GenTech or something like that, like in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With uh, what they were trying to make insulin, I think. That was probably one of the first early applications. Yeah, and I think you know back in the 70s and 80s, there's a sense of okay, like biotechnology is manipulating DNA, which is part of it but i think it's far from a complete picture of what it's become i think the thing that like i find remarkable not not i think dna in of itself is really f fascinating but i think the idea that an industry that has such a great capability to improve people's lives is just 40 years old and like we're still doing like really like a lot of this innovation that we're doing now is like privately funded in a lot of ways sure even publicly funded they're doing a crazy crazy amount of stuff but i just think it's fascinating that's only 40 years like you'd think that Oh, this has been around for a while. There's probably like some weird stories of people in Egypt doing, some, I don't know, starting like a little biotech company for uh, for the pharaohs or something. But yeah, no, it's only like a, like a couple decades old. Yeah, I think as maybe as a as a discipline that sees itself as that, and still, you know, you don't talk to a lot of people who think of themselves primarily as biotechnologists. Um, they might think of themselves as engineers or as geneticists or whatever else, but you know, you don't you don't often run into people who say, "Oh, I'm a biotechnologist." Like I study biotechnology. It just doesn't happen that much. Um, I actually do think that we've been doing what I think of as biotechnology for you know as long as we've had civilization. Um, 
back to the idea of understanding that a plant has interesting bioactive properties and then exploiting that plant for human medicine, that's biotechnology to me. I would agree with that. That's that's a, a fascinating take on it. I was I always think it's interesting to especially in the United States where like the Native American cultures aren't I don't know, like taught in schools to to read about the type of medicine that they use on a daily like a, on a daily basis. Like I was reading some some biographies on like Sitting Bull and they just they like they reference it and they go into it a little bit, but there's like an entire civilization like, you know, 10,000 years old of medicine that kind of just is slowly evaporating for lack of a better word. Yeah, I, I think maybe the trend was until sometime in the 20th century to have it evaporate, but I think I think we're coming around to understanding where those things are coming from and understanding that there is a scientific basis behind a lot of that. Um, better characterizing and better doing analytical chemistry, for instance, and then maybe maybe trying to incorporate it better into modern medicine, too. I think it's interesting to think about like someone a, a long time ago who doesn't have this scientific method as it's conceived today, trying to figure out if something's edible or not edible, or if this will like heal them or help them in some way. You can just like right. imagine like some guy... You probably have to be a little cracked or hurt to be a little cracked to like just randomly put stuff in his body and be like, this this feels good. <laughs> this helps. <laughs> right, right. The, the trial and error on that was probably pretty horrendous. Yeah, we didn't have high through for screening back then. Moving on to a different topic, and maybe this doesn't happen for you, but when you are overwhelmed with everything that's going on in life, are, are there things that you tend to do to get you back on track that's been particularly helpful? Yeah, in terms of work, um, I think the thing that I fear the most is coming up against the deadline and then not being able to meet it. And so I intentionally work very far in advance. Um, I've got content scheduled, I think, through September right now. Uh, and so I'm just, I just try to ensure myself that there's buffer for anything that happens. Um, you know, I get authors who come back to me and say they can't revise their article in the requested amount of time for every reason under the sun from I didn't get your email to begin with to, you know, this relative of mine has cancer and I need to go take care of her. Um, and, you know, I never want to have to say no to those people. And so I always just over overstock my pipeline with things that, you know, I'll take eventually. Um, but I really, I really try not to be panicky at deadlines. I think that that has helped me a lot. I think it's a smart way to go about it. That's kind of, kind of what I'm trying to do as well. Like, like life, <laughs> like uh, like uh, from the Jurassic Park thing, like life will find a way to kind of right. like, like mess up what you do. So like having a backlog for those times where you you know have to go take care of someone with, with cancer or there's or there's something that pops up, like you can just have like this backlog fill in and be completely consistent. And so like your your users and readers won't e won't even notice it, and they'll appreciate like the the fact that they're still getting content and everything's being taken care of. Yeah, exactly. And you know when you can tell a prospective author, yes, that's fine. Take another month. Um, they're happier with the process. They want to publish with you again. They're going to say nice things about you to other people in their field. So it just works out better for everyone. I bet. The, a question that I wrote down in my margins that I want to get to, because uh, we're, we're coming at the 45-minute mark, and I want to be respectful of your time, is of all the fields of biotechnology, if you, could, if you had to pick one to drill down and only talk about that or like even study it or just to read about it, what would be one that would most fascinate you to like spend time drilling down into? I think I'm a little biased here because my background is in chemical engineering, but I really like the idea of, um, of metabolic engineering, of synthetic biology, trying to take microorganisms and, yeah, even plants, and then trying to program them to do things that we want them to do. So I like this because I think, you know, we can leverage what nature has already come up with in terms of enzymes and pathways to do cool things with. But I also think it removes a lot of the ethical concerns um, with experimenting on, on other kinds of animals or things like that. You know, I don't think anybody is going to have a, a moral dilemma about processing bacteria a certain way. Um, you know, and in terms of the number of things you can do with it, there's, I don't even know, I couldn't even estimate the number of different species of bacteria um, and the number of kinds of specialty chemicals you might want to make eventually are infinite. And so I think there's just there's endless possibility there for making cool stuff. It's one of those areas that I know, I wish I knew more about, but like I never took the extent of my chemistry knowledge is just me teaching myself stuff because it's one that I never had to I never had to do for college. So it's like, right. and I hate being ignorant. So I like it's one of those things. If so, okay, so take someone who's like me who doesn't really understand chemistry all that much. What would be a good primer or a way to learn more about it so there'd be more conversation in it? 
so that they'd be more appreciative of what goes on. You know, I think getting back to what we talked about um, a while ago, I think find an activity that you like that does incorporate chemistry. And yeah, yeah, maybe that's brewing or maybe it's a gardening or um, maybe it's cars and you're interested in fuel blends or whatever. And I think, I think chemistry is great because it's so easy to find a practical extension of the topic. You know, it's not like you're, you're studying a really abstract uh, hardcore particle physics or something. Like you can't even see the things that you're talking about. Um, I think, I think it's really easy to find a hobby that even indirectly incorporates it. And then you can start to learn about it from that sense and then hopefully broaden your horizons even more. My desire to make wine would be a, <laughs> be a good uh, segue into it. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure you have relatives who do and want Christmas presents and it works great for that too. True. But then I, I, I don't know if I, if I poison them, they'd, they'd probably get mad at me. Right. <laughs> I'll make my girlfriend drink it. She'll, she'll, she'll drink wine. <laughs> Moving on to the, the last, is there anything that you wished you could have included in the top five trends that you didn't? And why? Okay, sure. Um, I think one thing that might be obvious, and I think the reason I didn't include it is because it's obvious, is the idea of CRISPR or genome editing. Um, and so probably anybody who's followed popular science news from the last four years knows of this. But, you know, we're getting really, really good at being able to edit genomes at will to put in things that code for proteins or to change an organism's sort of natural regulatory and, um, and signaling processes. So I think um, expanding the toolbox of what we can do with genome editing even more would probably be uh, number six on there. I was reading one article that was put out, like they were talking about doing gene drives in rats. I didn't know that they were working on mammals. I, I, I remember the mosquitoes, that they were finding pretty good promise in that, at least on the islands that they tested it. But I did not know that people were working on rats. Sure. So it would be effective, though. There's a lot of them. <laughs> there certainly are. What, one question I had, rats is sentient. I didn't know if rats were sentient. I know dolphins are sentient and like elf, elephants. I didn't know rats were sentient, but the article says they are. So I, I don't know. Are rats sentient? I think probably that's one of those things that different people mean different things by sentient. Um, we actually, so I'll plug my sister journal, um, Trends in Cognitive Science, and I know they've had a robust debate on that topic for uh, many decades. Cognitive Science. I'm writing that down. That'll be in the show notes for anyone who's interested like a handful of things on the planet that, rec that recognize themselves as selves, which is like one of the big ones for recognizing whether or not it's sentient, which is interesting. Like cephalopods are the big one that I like because they're, I think, I think if you give cephalopods a, like a couple more million years, they'll probably be rolling the place because they're like really smart. <laughs> well, they make like, they make houses and stuff and they like the camouflage themselves. Right. They're just weird creatures. And then like each arm has brain in it. Like each arm has little parts of like neurons so it can kind of like operate independently. Like how do you have a how do you have a bar fight with like someone with eight arms that thinks independently? You lose. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna lose that fight every time. Mm -hmm. Especially when uh one of their defense mechanisms. I don't know why I'm saying this, but when when something's trying to eat them, they'll just like go in your throat and like expand, and then they'll just crawl out when you're dead. It's like you, that's really creepy, right? Like I'm like people who eat. I would never eat any any form of cephalopod because I, I think they're just like too, too smart for that. It seems kind of mean, but mm -hmm. anyone that like eats that raw. You're taking your life in your own hands. Like, that thing wants to live. I don't know what you're doing. Because there's, like, always, like, those street uh, merchants and stuff that'll, like, try and eat them with, like, a stick or something. But apparently, if you eat it the right way, it's fine. But I, I just wouldn't. Probably, it's not, not a good use of time. <laughs> All right, moving into yesterday was, like, one end of a book chapter. What would be this chapter that you're working on now? Like, what's the next big? What would be, like, the title of this chapter? And what are you working on in that sense? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in terms of professional goals, um, I think two things here. Um, the first one would be continuing to define what we mean by biotechnology and um, really, really getting to a broader consensus on what that term means, um, who the community is, what the interesting research topics and uh, tools and applications are. Um, the other, I think, is a little more meta having to do with publishing, and that is continuing and, and expanding to defend the review article as a way of, of uh, consuming and transmitting knowledge. So, you know, I think we've, we've talked a little about this already, but the idea that there's just so much out there in terms of academic publication, you can't possibly read it all. Um, People were making this observation as early as 150 years ago, and it's it's certainly uh, truer today. And so I think 
Um, one thing that I would really like to accomplish here at Cell Press is to make better standards for what makes a good review and, and help people to write them in a way that makes sense but is also accessible and help better define how to peer review them um, and, and continue to assert for their place in the scientific literature. So that uh, instead of having to read 100 articles to find the one that you really wanted or the one that would have made, like giving you the information that you wanted, you can now read a couple of review articles that kind of give you a much better synthesis and then they can, they can talk about it in a way where you can drill down on certain parts where that they cited. Instead of having to do 100 random, it's more like 10 targeted, which is much better. Right. At least that's, that's where I see the benefit. And I, I, yeah. I, I definitely see it. So I think, I think that's a very achievable goal is I think the point I'm trying to, trying to get at just uh, kind of clinically, I think, uh, especially with a lot of the people I've been talking to, like they, they keep echoing back how staying up to date, it's like as soon it's like kind of like working out, like you miss a day and you're just like, do I, should I really go back to the gym? And then like the, one day misses, becomes like two days and then three days. And then it's like, there's so much that they have to get through. And then, so having like a, a really easy primer or a method to like get back onto that healthy habit of keeping themselves current, it's always really valuable. You know, that's great. So we can we can um, pitch ourselves the way to stay healthy without having to go to the gym every day. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that can that can be your, your, your slug line. <laughs> right. Like, is there anything that you'd love people to know? Your Twitter, the websites, those will be in the notes. Is there anything you'd especially like people to know? Or, just, you know, anything. Like, you could, I mean, I guess you could ramble in a different language for, like, a minute if you wanted. Uh, no, I think I'll uh, continue English being the only language that I'm fluent in. Um yeah, so I'll point people toward two things, two of our um, sort of non-journal product. Um, one of them is the Crosstalk blog, so that's crosstalk.cell.com. Um, that's where the article mentioned about the five biopic trends is published. Um, I'm a frequent writer and an associate editor of that blog, in addition to actually my job of editing my own journal. Um, the other one, the second thing, would be the Cell Press podcast. Um, you can get there, I think it's cell.com slash podcast, um, where I am an associate producer of that. So I help to wrangle interesting scientists and them to give their thoughts on their research. Thank you for listening today. Please subscribe, leave a review, check out our website, learningwithlowell.com, or join my mailing list. I'm here to learn and share what I learn. New episodes every Tuesday, new emails every Monday, and I blog on topics that I find fascinating.